Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> you have to turn stuff on for it to work. Um, so I'm up here to uh, walk through an introductory topic on open channel SSDs. And Jim Harris will join me uh, shortly to talk about how SPDK is going to be extended to, uh, to support these types of drives. So we still win the award for the longest disclaimer. Um, the agenda, I'm going to cover uh, what an open channel SSD is, uh, how you can create virtual volumes on an open channel SSD, the requirement for a host software model when using an open channel type SSD, and as I mentioned, Jim will come up and talk about uh, SPDK support going forward. How many people are familiar with what an open channel SSD is? So, not too many people. So. Um, I will keep it at a very high level at an introductory topic, as, as I mentioned. Uh, so some history on what Open Channel is uh, and what Project Denali is, if you may have heard of that. Uh, the history behind Open Channel SSDs is there's been, within the industry, several initiatives to try to make an SSD more responsive to a cloud scale provider, like, you know, you can think of who the large cloud scale guys are. They have very specific use cases for their uh, SSDs and they would like to get extreme control over managing those SSDs. There's been quite a bit of literature over the last few years that has talked about gating this capability on behalf of uh, these end users. Uh, but one of the major thrusts that has gained traction over the last several years is the push by Matthias Borling, who is a significant contributor to the block stack within Linux, he uh, published several papers on the value that an open channel SSD type drive can provide to end users. Uh, Microsoft picked some of that up and has published some papers on open channel SSD also. They've independently verified all this value uh, that these types of drives can have to cloud scale providers. And they've also gone so far as to create a project they're calling Denali that they, um, that they publicly made uh, available at Open Compute in March, I believe it was. Uh, Intel was featured in there uh, with a video uh, that talked about we were joining the Denali effort and at some point here in the near future, we're going to start coming out with uh, these types of drives. So that's a bit of history about where uh, open channel type drives have come from. And uh, I've got some links down at the bottom that talk about uh, Matthias's papers and some of the papers that uh, Microsoft had put together. So you feel free to investigate that if you want to in the future. But what are the key issues that were driving uh, these guys to want to do some of the work with these types of drives? So, Traditional SSDs, as you all know, have a FTL built into it. That FTL is tuned for a very general purpose use case. If, as an end user, you have a very specific use case, uh, you may not get the best type of performance out of that drive uh, that you want. The FTL that runs inside that drive uh, makes independent decisions. Uh, those decisions may be correctly be uh, made on behalf of the drive, uh, but what we're finding out from a lot of large cloud scale guys is the drives are not responsive enough for them. And some of the pain points that drive this is the fact that there's no control over background SSD operations in the drive. So when the drive has to manage NAND issues or deal with uh, error control and stuff like that in the drive, uh, the FTL just goes ahead and does that there is no way for the host to, the host system to control uh, when those operations happen. So they end up blocking high priority operations. One of the bigger uh, issues that cloud skill guys have, if you can think of an environment where you've got multiple tenants that are sharing drives, the capacity of our drives are getting larger over time, so this problem is going to increase over time. Uh, when you have multiple tenants with diverging requirements for performance uh, in a traditional drive, they will impact each other uh, and cause an overall degradation in performance across all those tenants. Uh, and basically, you can't control the quality of service for, 
for a specific tenant based on, on this reason. The pain point, the bottom pain point that I've got here listed is when you move to an open channel type SSD, uh, the FTL moves from the drive now to the host. So what's our solution going to look like? Uh, well, our open channel SSD type of a drive is going to allow the host to schedule background NAND media management operations. Uh, we call that A&M uh, or abstracted NAND management. And this is all the events that happen in the NAND media as you consume the NAND media. Um, those are now able to be controlled by, by the host system and not interrupt or not block uh, high priority operations from applications. The, another benefit is uh, having the physical placement of data within the drive. So physically being able to place data in particular NAND die allows you to co-locate application data. It also allows you to keep them separate so that performance of one application doesn't negatively impact performance of other applications in that system. Moving forward as part of our overall solution, uh, Intel is going to provide the drive. We are also going to develop host side software. Uh, so that bottom one I turned from red to green because our host side software will manage to take care of having that translation layer on the host now uh, and managing the SSDs. And our solution for having that type of software on an OC SSD will allow us to control the scheduling, control of background operation, operations and the placement of the data. So at a logical level, this, this looks, like, uh, looks like this is the transition from a legacy architecture to an open channel type architecture. And the diagram that I'm trying to show here is a system where I've got a cloud scale provider who's got multiple applications in their software defined storage layer. I show four apps across the top there. Uh, and I show a traditional SSD down at the bottom. And the traditional SSD at the bottom has built into it the FTL and the logical to physical FTL block that I show there. Uh, the drive also does all the background operations that we consider with garbage collection, wear leveling, managing the bad blocks, and managing the NAND media. Uh, in this instance, when I am using this drive at a cloud scale guy who's trying to share applications across thousands of drives, um, they're already making data placement decisions on where they want that data to go on the specific drives. They're also doing garbage collection and wear level and cross that collection of drives that they have in the system. Looking at it from this perspective, you have essentially a redundant processing that I'm showing in the red that is on both the host and uh, in, in the flash. And that redundant processing that happens in the flash, of our, as I've already described, comes to independent decisions on where to place data and how to place that data that may negatively impact the applications and their use of that data. Moving to the future architecture, uh, same situation, I've got multiple apps running on the host side. The FTL on the host side can be simplified depending on how the applications want to consume the flash. And that results in an, in an overall simplified system solution on behalf of, uh, of the customer who wants to use these types of uh, drives. And what I show is that the garbage collection wear leveling stays in the host. It's all operated on at the host level and the logical to physical FTL is gone from within uh, the SSD. So I'm gonna, this is a pretty detailed uh, slide. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but basically what I'm trying to show here is the command format on the top uh, right is straight out of the OC SSD 2.0 spec. And the host has control down to what's called the chunk level. And from the chunk level down, uh, the drive has control of that particular uh, addressing. So the host software can control placement of IOs uh, down to a channel uh, parallel unit, which is called a NAND die, and a chunk, which is a smaller subset within that die. I won't go into the details of that. Uh, but basically, what I show here is a, a future SSD that has a controller uh, in the block titled future SSD, and then I've got four tenants that are basically sharing, or not sharing, but are separating channels across each one of the particular uh, collections within that drive. So what are some of the benefits of what you see when you use one of these types of drives? Uh, in this description here, I show a test on the left-hand side where I've got 
three writers that are writing at 100%. I know the one gray in the middle says reader, but it should be writer. writer. So I've got three pathological writers that are writing to the drive, and I've got one reader uh, that's trying to read from the drive. Looking at the quality of service of the reader, that's the orange bars in, in the graph. Um, there's a significant push out as you move up to the two nines, three nines, four nines, five nines on, on behalf of those applications. When I use an open channel type SSD, one of the benefits you get with the physical isolation is, as I show in the bottom in the hardware, each one of the applications are completely separated across the physical NAND within that die. So those three writers, uh, they can be as pathological as they want with their subset of NAND. They generally will not impact the reader quality of service uh, at all. Uh, much tighter distribution on behalf of uh, on behalf of that reader in that situation. So this leads to uh, what is required from the host software to be able to manage one of these drives. And at a high level, what I'm showing here is some host software with the future SSD sitting down in the drive. Uh, ideally, these applications will be used in a direct access mode where you consume the NAND on the drive uh, in a direct fashion without block emulation. And a great example of that is a uh, storage engine beneath something like RocksDB. Um, it passes around objects that are much larger than 4K, so you don't necessarily need to drop that through a file system, turn that into a bunch of 4K blocks that then get managed in the drive. That being said, uh, as that's the preferred approach, uh, we realize that nobody's going to modify their applications to use an open channel SSD drive until they can prove the benefits of uh, utilizing that type of a drive. So, on the right-hand side, I show a legacy application, which this is your traditional 4K LBA type of, type of an application that you can pilot the application on there, get the demonstrated benefits of control of background operations and isolation, and then if you so choose, you can modify your application to use it directly. Uh, so what would that look like? From the application of a legacy uh, impl implementation, here I've got one that is high performance. I say it's high performance because it's using basically six channels to store uh, the I.O. for that particular application. Moving forward, I can also have an application that doesn't use as many channels. Uh, this is all under complete control of the host. You know, the host queries the geometry of the drive, finds out what the constraints are, uh, and it can uh, issue I.O. down to the drive uh, based on how it wants to segment the NAND that's available within that drive. I also show a management tool here, uh, which is basically uh, we're leveraging that for legacy tools to be able to have the management tool articulate to the software what parts of the drive are available to, say, application A, what parts of the drive are consumed by application B. Because as I mentioned earlier, when I look at legacy type applications, you don't want to modify those applications, but you still want to be able to use them on a OCSSD type drive. When I move forward to direct access type applications, as I touched on this, these would consume NAND directly, would not necessarily have an FTL or a logical to physical translation layer, again, depending on how they use, uh, how they use the flash within the drive. Um, and here I show an example of, again, uh, performance application because it's using multiple channels uh, resident in the drive. And likewise, I have the ability to instantiate an application that doesn't have as high of performance because it's uh, only using a subset of uh, channels that are available. So at a, at a high level, um, the beauty and capability of an open channel type architecture is it allows the host side software to completely define how it wants to use and consume the NAND that's available to the applications. It can consume it in a legacy type mode. It can consume it in a direct access type mode. Uh, we are providing these drives will be available uh, sometime in the near future. They haven't necessarily been publicly announced yet. Uh, but when we do deliver these, we will also deliver them with a host software package uh, that, that runs with that. And on my last slide, the warning I have here is the host is in full control. So what that means is if you have an application 
and you're the host software and you're consuming NAND block, uh, you can completely wear out that NAND block. That's open channel SSD does not have a safety net. It will not prevent you from destroying, uh, destroying the NAND inside the drive. The trade-off to that contract is that you use the flash in an intelligent fashion uh, and you leverage the capabilities of eking out every last bit of performance out of the NAND that you cannot traditionally get out of, out of a legacy type drive that's uh, based on you know, 4K LBA sectors. As I said before, those FTLs are typically tuned uh, for a very general purpose application. The other beauty of, of these types of drives is in a legacy drive, you have one FTL that runs across the entire drive, as I'm showing here. You can utilize and consume the flash uh, by different applications in, in different modes. Uh, you know, one example we like to use all the time, again, for the direct access is RocksDB. Uh, when I store S tables in RocksDB, there's no reason to drop them through a file system and turn them into 4K. Oh, I can just use flash uh, directly. And if I round robin my S tables across the flash, I really don't have a wear out, wear out problem. Uh, and I can consume part of my NAND uh, by a direct access application, leverage the maximum benefit, and I can also consume other parts of the NAND with legacy applications. That's not something you can uh, traditionally do with a, uh, with a legacy type drive. So with that, I will pass that on to Jim. Okay, lucky you, you guys get to all see me again. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what SPDK's plans are uh, for open channels. So, you know, a lot of this is obviously gonna be based around the SPDK NVMe driver. Uh, today, it's got a block API. It has commands we're all familiar with, read, write, trim, get capacity, you know, kind of the basic operations that you have on a, uh, on a block device. Um, and then those all, you know, typically operate on logical block addresses, right? So it's a, you know, it's a logical block address. The, as John mentioned, inside of the SSD, it's actually translating that into a flash page. But as we start to do open channel NVMe SSDs, we obviously need a new API. And so uh, this is something that um, the team at Intel is going to be working on over the next uh, next few months. I mark it as experimental. Um, as John mentioned, uh, you know, the open channel spec is out there. You know, there's drives that are using it. It's not officially part of the NVMe spec yet. So, you know, I think as some of this Denali work uh, moves forward, there may be changes in the API, which may drive changes, uh, I'm sorry, changes in the spec, which may drive changes we need in the API. So really what we wanna do is get an experimental API out there that people can start using, provide feedback, um, and then as the specification evolves and gets ratified, then we can make this a more solid API within SPDK. So to kind of, you know, talk about what are the operations that you need to do? Because, um, you know, I think these operations are gonna happen one way or another, what the exact commands are and the opcodes, those things may change. Uh, but I thought it might be useful to just kind of walk through, you know, today, how does this work with the open channel spec? And what are some of those um, new operations that you need to do? So to start here, uh, so open channel SSDs today actually reuse the NVMe read, uh, write, and the DSM, the deallocate commands. Uh, so when you want to read a flash page, you do a normal NVMe read command. And the main difference is that instead of a logical block address, if you remember one of John's first slides up in the upper right, it kind of showed this 64-bit and it had like a, um, a mapping. There was uh, certain bits were used for certain parts. So you could have like one, you know, one set of the bits was for the channel, one was for the chunk, one was for the page within it. And so basically it's, it's overloading that command for read and write. And then also for, for erase, they've overloaded the, the deallocate command to be able to erase a flash block. So some of the new commands that open channel adds, um, you know, which will be in the final spec in one way or another, one is uh, what they call scattered IO. Uh, so I think everybody's familiar with scatter gather lists for, for representing, you know, scattered memory chunks in host memory. Um, scattered I.O. is basically saying, I want this data to be written, but specifying non-contiguous flash blocks on the SSD. 
Uh, so this is something that the open channel spec has today for read, write, erase, and then even copying. So for cases where you're doing, uh, you know, defrag, uh, you can actually send something, you know, send an I.O. to the device and you can have a copy from one flash page to another within the SSD and not have to traverse that through host memory. Another one is uh, getting the geometry. So, you know, now that you're controlling all of the, the flash media, you have to understand how is it actually laid out on the SSD so that you can provide these commands for, you know, the data to the read and the write and the deallocate for how to manage it. So the geometry kind of tells you how it's laid out on the drive you know, how many bits do you use for each, um, each tier and how the flash is organized. Uh, get chunk information. Uh, so as John mentioned, uh, open channel, you can really shoot yourself in the foot. Get chunk information is actually what tells you each of those, you know, flat, each of those erase blocks, what's the wear on it? So that you know as you're gonna do your wear leveling now up in host memory, how can you, uh, uh, you know, get that information. And so they add a new log page where you can get the information for each of the flash blocks that are on the SSD. And then finally, there's a, in NVMe, they have the get set features, and so there's one for media feedback. And so this is one where whenever you do a read command, it can set extra bits in the completion word to basically say whether that data needs to be refreshed. Um, so again, that's another one that's gonna be in the final spec one way or another. This is how it's currently implemented in open channel, um, the open channel spec. Okay, so that's, you know, that's really what we're gonna be focusing on as a project over the next six months. Um, you know, next, gonna talk a little bit about what some of the future work uh, could be. Um, this isn't planned specifically for the SP, SPDK community yet, um, you know, but one would be what, what I'm calling an OC SSD BDEV module. So uh, John's slides talked about uh, like the legacy block and then the direct, the direct mode. This is basically legacy block. So this would be taking an open channel SSD and being able to present um, that flash as block devices. So this is that traditional, uh, traditional model. This would be similar to the P block driver that's in the Linux kernel for those that are, that are familiar. And then next would be those, um, those direct use cases. So yeah, things like uh, RoxyB, so basically having a log, putting those SS table files in a log, um, not running it through a block device layer, just writing it out uh, directly to flash media. I think there's probably a lot of other use cases here. And so I think this is gonna be another one of those areas of, uh, of investigation and, and work that uh, the SBDK project will be doing um, after this open channel API is ready. So summary, um, yeah, open channel provides more control to your applications, can use that to provide better isolation, um, really optimize some of those non-block usage models, um, but it's not for everybody. As John said, I mean, it's a, lot of, it's a lot of work, right? You no longer, we've even talked about from a testing level, and we're gonna test this with SPDK. So we can write our hello world test, and it always writes to LBA0 on the device, and the SSD saves us, right, because that LBA0, he's gonna put it on different flash pages every time we run the test. Well, that doesn't work now with an open channel SSD, right? If we just pick one flash page, we're gonna wear that out, and so even from a testing perspective, there's extra work we're gonna need to do. And that's even more so for applications that are gonna be developing on top of these SSDs. And so, yeah, finally, you know, the support's gonna be added. You can expect to see APIs probably out in the next month or two. Um, and those will be, you know, RFCs on Garrett Hub and you'll be able to provide feedback and, and uh, kind of go from there. So with that, John, I don't know if you wanna come back, on, back up here for uh, questions. We got one up here. Uh, you mentioned that Intel will be developing the host side software for managing open channel SSDs. Will that be open sourced or included as part of SPDK? The, the answer to that is we will introduce an open source version and we will also have a proprietary version. Uh, Paul, is what's the time frame for that? TB, TBD. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. sorry. 
I haven't looked at the uh, open channel SSD spec. Uh, it, it seems possible, given the variety of operations that are possible with it, to lose um, item potence. It's, to lose what? Item potence. So if, if you do the same operation twice, you get different results, or you get the same result. Do we lose item potence here? I when you say, can you explain, would you, when you say different results, you mean right. different performance or different data? So, so with current um, disk devices actually of all types, if you do the same I.O. again, if you do the same get log page again, you, you, any, basically any operation, uh, if you do it again, you get the, the, the contents of the disk don't change. This feels like there might be opportunities where that isn't true anymore. Like well, copy so, operations yeah. or erase we, operations, or I, I, I guess I'm not sure. But do we have to start thinking about I/O at that level in terms of the order of operations? Well, I think I think the big thing is it's going to come down to the quality of that FTL. So I think today, where the you know the SSD has a very robust, you know, very highly tested FTL running inside the SSD. Now you're doing that all up in host software, and there's plenty of opportunities to mess that up. So I think I think that could be a big I think that could be a big part of it. Yeah, I mean there could certainly be operations that with an SSD they just work, and you find a bug in the FTL running in the host software, and maybe you do see something slightly different. Yeah, and one of the reasons why I was very explicitly talking about cloud scale uh, operations is it, those guys generally control the application and the storage, the both sides of the layer, so they can use the drives in a very benign fashion in a very optimized fashion and simplify the issues that they would see from an FTL. But, but yeah, if you're going to do a legacy application running through a 4K FTL and you're going to write that on, on your own, you will have all the same issues that we struggle with with the FTLs that we build into our drives today. But this is a way, the whole point of Open Channel SSD is to get around all those, to be able to allow somebody who's sophisticated the ability to eke every possible I.O. Out, out of the drive. Because what they see today is as you have multiple tenants using a drive, they pollute the drive and interleave data, and you have applications cross-talking, and it's a noisy neighbor problem, right? So um, you have background operations now because I consumed a certain part of the NAND that requires me to do something in the FTL. I'm not going to block you from doing any I.O. until I take care of that activity. All those operations, uh, are now gone or handled by the host. <laughs> okay, so well, if you simplify, if you simplify how your application uses it, it's it's actually very easy. So this um, is obviously a really hot topic, guys. We've got about eight questions, nine, ten questions. Um, so let's be judicious with our questions and judicious with our answers. Sorry. He's saying I talk too much, Nate. Um, me? Say that about you? <laughs> Never. Why you don't follow the Cinex labs uh, that, that what they call perfect NAND operation done still by the drive, so you avoid some of the issues that you're talking about? Yeah, perfect NAND is a technology that was uh, used in cell phones, right? And it, the whole point of it was to be able to consume the NAND directly. Why Absolutely. you don't use the same protocol like why did we not use the same protocol? Yeah, you seem to oh, take I, well, a different approach. Yeah, uh, so in my history slide, I talked about how it all came from Matthias, and the whole point was to leverage the NVMe commands that are already there. But so, still, you can leverage the NVMe commands. Um, yeah, there's no reason we could, but that's not the way it went. <laughs> could you talk more about uh, the vector IOs, the advantages you see for them up the stack and the complexities? So the vector commands basically allow you to, as James talked about, uh, scatter gather I.O. from one place to another in the drive. The whole point of that is to not pull that data across the interface uh, to the host, copy it in a buffer, and then send it right back down to be placed somewhere else in the drive. I, I think one of the other things is if you were like writing, like let's say you had a large amount of data you wanted to write, and maybe part of it's going to fill up the end of one flash block, and then you want to send the, the rest to fill up the rest of the next flash block. Um, it would offer you things, you know, ways to do that as well, because you really couldn't do that if you can only specify uh, pages that were, you know, within one contiguous chunk. So the plan is to put 
the uh, FTL in the driver in SPTK? So I think, so f I mean, from the SPDK, like the open source, you know, project perspective, I think there's nobody to, so, I mean, John talked a little bit about some of the work that the, the NDM Solutions Group is doing, and so I think, you know, what you're saying is there's going to be some version of that that's going to be open source. We have to figure out, you yeah. know. Um, but still, functionally, there'll be an FTL in, in uh, you mentioned RocksDB that, you know. So, yeah, so um, back, back to my description, for the legacy type applications, that'll be a 4K LBA type FTL. But right. our view is that most people who want to use open channel SSDs will more be in the, what we're calling the direct access model, where they will directly consume the NAND flash without a 4K LBA translation layer because it's more efficient. Okay. So if you have an application that consumes stuff at larger than, say, an erase block in the flash, there's no reason to break that up into 4K FTLs and have no, a I, file I, system manage that and ha duplicate the I.O. that you do. Um, you can just round robin that amount of flash. I, right. it's so much I understand that. So the, if it's located in the driver stack or in the application someplace, then what's the plan for providing persistence of the FTL during power fail? So that's built into uh, how you build your FTL. And that's one of the reasons we're providing uh, open source software as an example on how to get around some of those issues and why we're also building a proprietary version that will have you know, better capability than the open source version. And so we plan on allowing people to teach people on how to, how to use it correctly and oh. offering a better solution simultaneously. I, I, also, I, I think for the use case for persistent memory too. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of ways. Yeah, I think persistent memory is one way that that FTL could be done. I think there's That's also going to be use cases where there'll be like a persistent memory buffer within the SSD itself that could be used. Um, I, what was the last? If it's persistent memory, then it's not. Yeah, then it's the two. But I think there's a... Right. I mean, but there are use cases where I think, like, the node is the failure, not just the individual SSD. But you're right. If you put the FTL on persistent memory, then it does separate that from the SSD. It's, you couldn't just take the SSD, put it somewhere else. You've got to have the FTL to go with it. Yeah. So, so th to that point, uh, so it's, it sounds to me the, the, the open channel is moving towards to the direction you want to bypass the black uh, layer, right, Bl black layer. So what, what are you guys thinking about uh, the, the PMAM, right? You have another framework with this. Are they going to be, the, you know, the, at some point going to merge together or you want to have a different, uh, you know, different track? This is a SPDK plus. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be hard for it to really fully move together because while it's still not traditional legacy block mode, it's still you're writing 4K at a time. Okay. And so I think it's going to be hard to make it like a persistent memory where it's, you know, it's a byte or cache line. So you still have to solve the RBA, those kind of mapping things. Right? Yeah, okay. yeah. So you, you want to keep them separate? Yes. What's that? Yes, I, yeah, we will both be, well, I'll stick around. you're going to be around for a little bit. Yeah. I'll be here the rest of the day. Yeah, so anybody, if we don't get to your questions, please find me because we'd love to talk about this more. Okay, this question is more for uh, open channel, but uh, I guess this could change how drives are uh, rated for where. So would they just rate them as, you know, petabytes? Pure petabytes number right and yeah so the traditional device rights per day uh, is meaningless in this right. scenario because you don't have over provisioning and you don't have uh, that protection that we talked about right. to keep you from wearing a drive out uh, what we will do though is uh, track uh, race operation uh, to to each block so you you P can cycles. read out the consumption of the drive right so the the information will still be there it's just it's available in a different way but the vendors will sell them rating it in that particular way, whatever. The rating would be meaningless for an open channel yeah, drive. Right. Yeah. Okay. Last question. So I wonder when will well, we have that, like um, for multi vendor support kind of things, so do it where? So that's one of the reasons when I talked about the project Denali, that Microsoft was uh, putting that together. They want to have an ecosystem that has multiple vendors available. And they're shooting for 2019, early, mid-2019 for that to be available. Okay. 
All right. So just to reiterate, you guys can get a hold of, we have a networking event here in a little bit, you know, after we finish. If you guys still have open channel related questions or what SPDK is doing with it, you can, you know, grab a beer, give it to Jim, and he'll talk to you for an hour. And if John's still around, that's great. He'll do the same. <laughs>